Hi guys, we're on to the next lecture of aircraft flight mechanics. You probably guessed we are linearizing the equations of motion today. So let's have a look at what we've developed and, and we'll talk a little bit about why we need to do it. So we've got the translational and the rotational equations of motion. And together these six equations comprise the aircraft nonlinear equations of motion. We've also got these ones here. These take um, Euler rates and put them into aircraft body rates. So this is and we also showed the inverse of this matrix as well just because that's actually a bit of a bastard to do the inverse of a 3 by 3. So these are the ones that we want to use um, and then we've also got these ones that help us describe aircraft position. So let's first talk about how we know they're nonlinear. Um, again, this is really obvious stuff, hopefully, but let's just remind ourselves. You can see I've probably I've put these in a slightly different format to how I would have presented them previously. So I've just put all of my non-conservative forces. So that is the aerodynamic and the propulsive forces into a single term X, which is just the, the X force. So that was equal to D cos alpha plus L sine alpha plus T cosine theta T, which is the thrust axis inclination. So let's just think things that help us or things that tell us that these are nonlinear. We've got trig terms. So here we've got things that are trigonometric terms of the aircraft attitude. We've then got products here. So here this is the x equation of motion. So the x equation of motion is a function of the x acceleration and then the products of the off axis velocity. Okay, so those products don't help us. Those, those are going to be nonlinear. And then this is a very nonlinear expression because we've got, again, we've got trig terms in here. Alpha itself is a trigonometric term. So alpha is defined as the arctangent of W on U. And then we know that the lift is going to be a nonlinear function of alpha as well. So you know, remove my dog because she's scurrying around making a lot of noise somewhere. Bobby, can you get out and do something else please? That'd be great. Whatever you're doing, it's very noisy. I'd love you to go, go somewhere else. Thank you. Okay, so she's now just being annoying here instead. So we know that alpha is a non-linear function of w and u and then we also know that lift is a function of alpha so it's, it's a non-linear function there this whole mess of an equation that we've got up here then big non-linear thing same we could do similar expressions here and look at these two as well um but we could use these expressions we you know now that we've got computers um hopefully we've all got computers we could take um, um let's just define something here we'll say that our state variables State variables, sometimes called the aircraft states. These are U, V, W, P, Q, and R. And these are enough to describe the aircraft motion at any given instant in, instance in time. So we can see that we've got um, the aircraft, say for example, the aircraft um, acceleration is going to be related to the other states and then some non-state variables around here, okay? So we could, for example, using these these equations, we could, I'm gonna just go and ask my dog to move again. This is the third time I've tried to record this quality lecture. Bobby, I love you, but can you do that anywhere else? Literally anywhere else in the house, that would be great. Okay, this bone, go and chill it over here. Thank you. You can be in here, but if you're gonna be in here, don't do that. Okay, back again. So, um, <laughs> it's getting ridiculous. So uh, we could take these equations, these these coupled nonlinear equations, and we could time march them.
So we could select a given disturbance and then we could work out the aircraft response in time based upon how we solve these, you, you know, use MATLAB, use ODE45, use an equivalent in Python. We could step through these differential equations. Um, reasons, let's have a think about why we have these linearized expressions then. So we obviously don't do this all the time. Firstly, because uh, we were building aircraft long before we numerically solve differential equations. Secondly, um, this is computationally intensive. So even though we can do this method, it is computationally intensive. Um, secondly, we could time step through and work out the aircraft response to a given um, input. It doesn't tell us anything about the stability of the aircraft, although we could determine some stability characteristics based upon a time marching. This doesn't give us a general solution that helps us think about the stability of the aircraft. And lastly, I'll say this because it's, it's inelegant. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's an brute force means of determining what's going on in an aircraft. We're going to show that we can take these equations of motion, we'll put them into two separate sets, the longitudinal and the lateral directional, and then the characteristic equation of those matrices that we're going to form. Um, tell us everything we need to know about, about the transient characteristics of, of an aircraft. That's pretty cool. Okay, that's a cool bit of mathematics. Um, and it's just much more elegant than what we've done. So let's think about um, how we would generally solve a sort of any system and look at its transient characteristics. Okay, so the first step, um, and we're doing this for an aircraft, but these are generally the same for any system. Um, first step is to define a mathematical model. Okay, so back in module three, we're done. We've got that. We've got our mathematical model. We've got the aircraft equations of motion. Two, we're going to um, determine the open loop stability characteristics. And we started to do some of this in module two, where we looked at things like the sign of CM alpha based upon the longitudinal CG position. Open loop for our purposes means stick fixed. Okay, so if we think about open versus closed loop for systems, open loop is where we don't have a control system feeding back in, taking the output, doing something to it and feeding it back into the system. For our purposes, that's the stick is then in a fixed position. So this is for us, this is our open loop stability characteristics. And we started to do this in module two, but we need to take it further because we don't know what happens to the aircraft in all, um, basically in all of these coupled modes of motion together. We only looked at a few examples. Then we can look at the transient characteristics. So remember that module two is looking at static stability. This is looking at what the tendency is to return, transient characteristics, does it actually return? Okay, and then four, which we might get into in this course. I think I'm, I'm able to go through things a little bit faster um, in these online lectures. So hopefully we can get to it. I haven't in the last couple of years. We're gonna look at defining a control system for our aircraft. Hey, Bobby. Um, define a control system for our aircraft and then use that to feed back the output into the um, 
into our system and then hopefully we can take an, an aircraft that would be otherwise unstable and turn it into a stable one so this is then looking at the closed loop and I'm going to repeat two and three okay so we do this again for our aircraft so how are we going to do this well we've got our mathematical model and we've got our our um, non-linear equations of motion we're going to want to linearize them now so we're going to linearize them in order to develop expressions that help us sort of come up with a more general means of looking at two and three here so let's look at linearizing them So you've already used some of the theory for linearization. You might not have realized that's what we were using. Okay, so any time that we've applied a small angle assumption, that is taking a it's linearizing the expression the dog is being the most annoying she's ever been at the moment thank you love okay so you've already used some of this um and we're gonna that's just giving us an indication of what this whole sort of non-linear, taking something non-linear, turning it into a linear expression is. It's just turning it into an expression that we can use um, for our purposes. So uh, we're going to use, in this idea here, any small angle, we're going to use something very similar to this for all of our other quantities. We'll use small perturbation theory. small disturbance or small perturbation. And the basics of this theory is that any aircraft state or non-state variable can be made of two things. I realize I've just put this here, any state or non-state variable. I could have just said any, any variable, but okay, any state or non-state variable can be represented at a given instant in time as the sum. of a, and let's keep these colors consistent, of a trim or equilibrium value and a small perturbation. Nope, let's keep these in red. So we'll say that our instantaneous value, um, let's write that in blue. Oh, you can see where I started to write this earlier and I had to stop, but let's go down here. This is the second time I've gone through this because my computer wasn't recording properly, um, which is super fun when I've gone through 30 minutes of talking at the camera, recording a lecture, but that's why that all of, that's why all of this has been pre-written. So I'll just ignore that. So we'll say the instantaneous value is equal to the trim value 
plus small perturbation. So we need some nomenclature that's going to help us represent these different things. And the nomenclature for these gets a little bit inconsistent, like all of flight mechanics is inconsistent from book to book to course to course. Um, I've tried to keep this in a means that's consistent. I following what Louis Schmidt uses in his flight dynamics book, which I think is really good. Um, it's similar in some parts to my own undergraduate notes. There's bits that I don't like from my own undergrad notes, so I've changed them this year. Um, and there's bits that I don't like in Tom Yekout's book at the moment, the way he does this. So just copy what I'm doing, copy what's in the notes, and be aware that when you're looking at other sources, some of this changes a little bit. So we've got the things that we're going to need to talk about are aircraft rates. So we've got U, V, W, P, Q, and R, translational and angular rates. We're going to need to think about the aircraft orientation or its attitude, so psi, theta, phi. And we're going to talk about forces and moments, so x, y, z, l, m, n, and then all of the control settings. We're going to need to think about the control settings on the aircraft. We need to be able to have a means of talking about three different values of each of these, one for instantaneous, one for trim, and one for the small perturbation. And annoyingly, like with all these things, the nomenclature changes a little bit depending which one we're going to look at. Um, so let's talk about it and you can be annoyed about it as I show you how they're all slightly different. Okay, so let's say our angular rates, these are all similar. <laughs> um, let's say we've got U, V, W, P, Q and R. So these are our angular rates, the instantaneous value. These are equal to the trim value is going to be denoted by continuing with uppercase and I'm going to put a subscript zero. So u naught, v naught, w naught, p naught, q naught, and r naught. And then our small perturbation is going to be just lowercase. Okay, so we've got the lowercase u lowercase v, lowercase w, p, q, and r. I prefer writing the, all of the lowercase versions of the Latin alphabet than the uppercase here. I think they're easier to, to distinguish. So that's good because we're going to end up using these a lot more than we end up using these. So that's good. Okay, so those are how we look at rates. Like I say, these differ from which book you're looking at. Some um, some books might say actually these are with a, with a with a, a, an apostrophe or a, a prime symbol after it. Some of them might have um, a tilde on top. Some of these might have a subscript one. Some of them have a subscript e. I don't like these because one denotes something came before it. Zero just makes more sense to me for equilibrium. E also makes sense for equilibrium, but it's confusing because it could be Earth axes. So these are ones you might see. I'm not using them. Okay, we'll use, just pay attention to what you see in different books. Let's talk about aircraft attitude now. Now I'm going to write these slightly differently. So let's say I've got roll, pitch, and yaw. So roll is uppercase phi, pitch is uppercase theta, and then I've got uppercase psi. Those are my totals. And then my trim is simply going to be all of those with zero, and all of those with a zero. And then I just use the lowercase quantities for each of these. Now these are difficult because I really hate writing uppercase Greek letters. I think I'm terrible at it because I, I'm not Greek. Um, so I'm often pretty lazy and you'll, you will have noticed in the preceding chapters, I just used lowercase Greek letters for everything anyway. That's why it's important to keep this subscript zero to denote the equilibrium value here. 
from this point when we're going through, you've just got to pay attention to the equations and think, is this a trim state? Is it the, is it the small perturbation or is it this total quantity that I've got? Usually from context, it's clear. Um, whenever I'm typing anything up, I try and keep these as uppercase. Um, but for the purpose of this course and writing online, uppercase theta and psi look terrible as characters. So I've just, I'm going to try and keep this going on. Okay. Um, so I'll try, I'll try and just make it clear from, from usage, what I'm actually using, whether it's perturbation or whether it's the, the full value. Um, maybe, um, in fact, let's, I'm going to change the nomenclature in here. I'm just going to say the perturbation is going to have a dash on them. Okay. Because I realize this is going to be confusing for you guys otherwise. So let's, uh, let's keep these all as lowercase as well. Okay, and those colors are all wrong anyway, but we've got the total trim and small perturbation here, okay? I'll adjust, I'll adjust the notes to include these primes here. This sort of makes sense, otherwise it's gonna get confusing and it's inconsistent with module three. So this way I've just written it is consistent, makes sense, I'm gonna update the notes. So those are our attitudes. Let's think about forces and moments. Oh my goodness, let me go and uh, just close the door. No, go, no, no, no. What's she doing? Thank you. It's fine, she's done, just showing went and I went to close the door and then she scammed it in here thinking I was, that there was... So I said no, because she was trying to walk through a closed door. Okay, back. Forces and moments. Like I say, guys, about the second time I've gone through this, I'm not going to pause for all of these dog moments. So forces and moments, uh, let's just keep these as X. Y, Z, L, M, and N. These are equal to the total value, sorry, the, um, the trim value. And then the small perturbation is simply, we can't use the lowercase because the lowercase for these is the, dis for these, so, Lowercase x, y, and z are just then ordinates, and lowercase l, m, and n. Well, it's only the l gets confusing, but we can't we can't use them because of the the ways that we often use these letters to mean more than one thing in this course. Okay, so those are the forces and moments. And the last ones we've got are the control settings. Let's keep these in a sensible order. So aileron for roll. Elevator for pitch and the rudder for yaw. Okay, so those are our total values. These are equal to the trim plus a small perturbation. And these we put a prime after. Okay, so though that's our procedure that we're going to use to take all of our variables and we've now got 
wherever we had one variable, we then got two to express it instead. I'm just going to ask Poppy to move again. The trouble with having a dog that loves you very much is that she often wants to come and sit next to you and chew on hard plastic bones that she wants to then drop on the floor and make a lot of noise. And that's fine, Poppy, because I love you very much, but you're very, very annoying. So sorry for the repeated interruptions, guys. Um, so we've now got this, this, this um, means that we can uh, represent each of our variables, both state and non-state variables, by the sum of a trim value and a small perturbation. So we're going to follow the same procedure um, each time when we non when we non-dimensionalize each of our equations. So let's talk about how that procedure is going to work. Non-dimensionalization <laughs> procedure. Still not certain that's spelled correctly, but I'm just going to go ahead with it anyway. So we'll talk about um, how we're going to go ahead with things. So we're going to make some assumptions about our trim state. Okay, so these assumptions we're going to make, we're going to say, firstly, there's no resultant accelerations on the aircraft. Okay, this isn't really an assumption, this is just the definition of trim. But if this is the case, then any of our states, that um, they're going to be constant with time. So, u dot e, Sorry, u dot o is equal to v dot o is equal to w dot o, which is equal to p dot o. Those are all equal to zero. Okay, so we have no resultant accelerations on the aircraft. And remember, these are just the just the um, the trim value of each of these. So there will still be, this doesn't mean doesn't mean that, okay? It doesn't mean that it won't be equal to zero, but it doesn't mean that lowercase u dot is equal to zero. We're gonna assume we have no angular velocity in our trim state. So that's P is equal to Q is equal to R. So those are all equal to zero. Our aircraft isn't turning or it isn't changing its attitude, I should say. We're going to further assume wings level. So that means that our equilibrium roll rate is zero. And we're going to assume that we've got um, symmetric flights. And we're going to assume that we're representing our velocities in stability axes. So that means that v naught is equal to w naught, those are equal to zero. So these are going to help us because we're going to be able to use these when we want to non-dimensionalize our equation. So these are our trim assumptions. So the non-dimensional, sorry, the actual procedure we're going to follow, which is, let's move this down. You see, I, I wrote the heading before I realized I should have spoken about the trim states. 
the procedure we're going to follow is first we're going to take one of our, our non-linear equations of motion and we're going to replace every variable with that trim and the perturbation. Okay, we're then going to say with some of those we know are going to be equal to zero. So we're then going to remove zero terms from our trim assumptions. Three, we're then going to multiply them out. And we're going to remove all um, all products and powers and we're going to assume small angles throughout. What do I mean by products and powers of small terms? So if we've got A is less than one, B is less than one, then A multiplied by B is much, much less than one. And for our purposes, is effectively equal to zero. So we can just get rid of it. Okay, and once we've done this, we've multiplied everything out, we're then gonna take the original nonlinear equation and we'll just evaluate it at the trim condition. So we'll see if we can come up with something that when we substitute it back into here, it helps us get rid of things. And this will become clear when we go through an example. Okay, so we'll go through a an example of how this is supposed to work. So let's start out, makes sense, start out with the x equation of motion, x equation translational motion. Okay, so the x equation of motion or the u velocity equation of motion. So let's just write it out. u dot plus qw minus vr. Let's write that as rv is equal to x minus mg. I just copied this down from the notes. I can see there's a mistake in the notes. This was written incorrectly. So this is right up here. You can always tell, you can just go through and think about whether these are right or not. So your x equation should have u dot, your y equation should have v dot, your z equation should have w dot. And then it should have the other two velocities multiplied by the other two, I can't do that, the other two uh, angles. So w, which is heave velocity, should be multiplied by pitch rate and then side of the velocity should be multiplied by your rate. And you get the sign of these just from doing the cross product correctly. But it's easy to see if you've made a mistake or if I've messed up, which I have here in the notes, um, that was incorrect in the notes. I'm gonna amend that. So we've got our equation of motion. Now what we need to do is we need to replace everything in here with the trim plus the perturbation. So then u dot is equal to ue plus u, 
Q is equal to QE plus Q and so on. So let's go through and do that. So M U dot E, sorry, U dot zero. This is bad. I've changed the nomenclature this year because I, I was previously using um, E following following an older textbook. And I just think it gets confusing with the earth axes. So sometimes I might make a mistake and write a subscript E in this module. It's always going to be an O or it should be an O or a zero really, I should say. Okay, so I've got u naught dot plus u dot plus q naught plus q w naught plus w minus r naught plus r v naught plus v is equal to x naught plus delta x minus mg sine theta naught plus theta prime. Yeah, that's the nomenclature we're using. So this is now my expression where each of my variables has been replaced with the trim small perturbation. So we know we can get rid of some of these from our uh, trim assumptions immediately. So we know we can get rid of any of the rate terms here. So there's no, there isn't any um, acceleration. So no acceleration. Let's do this in different colors. Let's say no rates. Um, we can cross these two out because we've got no side slip and we're in stability. Okay, so that's all we can do to the left hand side. We can, oh, we've got, um, because we're in, because we're in equilibrium, we can also, uh, we're not going to, we're not going to do it yet. We're, we're going to, sorry, I was about to say we can get rid of X naught. We can't get rid of it yet. We will do. But what we can do is we can use the sine addition formula to multiply this out. So let's say sine of theta naught plus theta dash is equal to sine theta naught cosine theta prime plus sine theta prime cosine theta naught. Okay, so now we've applied the trim assumptions. We're now gonna see, and we're gonna assume everything's small. So let's, uh, let's multiply this out first. Let's say I've got M new dot plus qw minus rv is equal to x naught plus delta x minus mg sine theta naught cos theta dash minus sine theta dash cosine theta naught. So this, we're gonna to have to do this in a couple of steps here. So all of these terms, these are all small perturbations, okay? So anytime you've got two of them multiplied together, it's much, much less than one. So these go, these disappear. We're gonna say that u dot is much bigger and QW minus RV in this case. So we can get rid of those from the left-hand side. Um, we can also see over here that this is just going to go to one. Um, and then this is going to go to theta 
dash in this case. So let's write this out. I've got mu dot x naught plus delta x minus mg sine theta naught minus theta dot cosine theta naught. So let's just remind ourselves what all these terms are. Aircraft mass, perturbation of the forward speed, um, sorry, perturbation velocity of the forward, acceler forward acceleration because that's u dot. I've got the trim x force, I've got the perturbation x force, aircraft mass again, um, gravitational acceleration, I've got the trim pitch angle, I've got the perturbation pitch angle, and the trim pitch angle again. So we're now going to go back to the this equation up here and evaluate it at the trim state. Let's just rewrite the equation down here. So for our purposes, the nonlinear equation of motion, we had m u dot plus q w minus wr is equal to x minus mg sine theta. So we're going to say what happens when we're in trim. Well, we had all of our trim assumptions before. So we're going to say that in our trim assumptions, we can get rid of the everything in this part here. So this there isn't any result in acceleration in trim, and there's no rate. So we can get rid of all of these. Okay, and then we replace the theta with a uh, with a theta naught, and we replace x with an x naught in this case. So we just said that zero is equal to x naught minus mg sine theta naught in this case. So looking at this expression up here. Let's just see, let's just highlight this in blue. No, it's not a highlighter, that's a pen. X minus mg sine naught is zero. So x naught minus mg sine naught. We can either oh, hasn't sort of highlighted. This is highlighted here, and this is highlighted up here. Okay, so this is equal to these two terms here. Okay, so we can just get rid of them. So we can s substitute this into, let's say, what does this then give us? Well, it's just it's this expression without those terms in. So we have m u dot is equal to delta x plus There's a mistake up here. Mistake is there should be a plus sign in here, sorry. Plus mg. So now this is minus down here. Yeah, that's right. Okay, because there was a minus sign in front of the bracket and I forgot to collect that into the bracket. Okay, so what we've got, this is the nonlinear expression for an half motion. So we started out with, um, oh, sorry, but this, we started out with this one here, which is which is our nonlinear expression. So we had, effectively, we had three big terms on the left-hand side, two on the right. We said, well, actually, our nonlinear expression is that all that really matters is the perturbational velocity. Okay, so this is the only bit that matters. We went through the whole procedure to get there and we will have to use this procedure each time. If we do the same with the rest of the expressions, we end up showing 
Let's write these all out. So mv dot is equal to delta y minus m u naught r plus mg phi naught. That's not phi naught. That's phi prime cosine theta naught. So it's the perturbational roll angle and the steady state pitch angle. And then mw dots is equal to delta z plus mu naught q minus mg theta prime sine theta naught. So this is then the perturbational pitch and then the trim pitch angle in this case. Let's just make sure we've got these highlighted out. So we've got um, perturbational roll. That was a bit confusing for me to go through this because I said we would change those nomenclatures to include those primes. The notes that I wrote this morning are, don't have those in yet, so I was getting a little bit confused there. I would like you guys to go through and do these two nonlinearizations. Okay, so it's the exact same procedure as we just did to get this to get these two. And if you do this, show me your working, scan your working, post it on Slack. Um, if you do it before Wednesday, I'll give you some extra credit for it. I want to see you doing this stuff. I want to see you getting it done. Okay. First, however many people I, I think it being valid to do. Okay. Um, similarly, we can do the exact same thing with the with the rotational equations of motion. We end up with I x x p dot minus I x z r dot is equal to delta L. I y y q dot is equal to delta m. That's a nice and easy one. And then I z z r dot minus I x z p dot is equal to delta n. Just the same, guys. I want you guys to be able to go through and get these same expressions. So we, again, start with these. Okay, so we're starting out with these expressions, taking each of the variables, replacing them with the trim plus the perturbational value. Obviously with these, ixx, iyy, etc., those are just constants. There aren't um, perturbations of those. So for p dot, q dot, r dot, r dot p q and l replace those all with those trim plus perturbation multiply them out products of small powers sorry products and powers of small terms you can get rid of um, make the small angle assumption evaluate the original expression at the trim state to tell you what you can get rid of and then bob's your uncle you should have these expressions here you should have them by that point okay and we can do the exact same thing finally with the Euler rates. And if we do the Euler ones, we end up with P is equal to the perturbational value of the roll attitude change multiplied by the perturbational value of the your attitude change multiplied by the steady state trim value of pitch. Q is nice and easy. Q is just the perturbational value of the pitch attitude change. And then R is equal to perturbational value of the your attitude change multiplied by cosine 
of the pitch angle in this case. So make sure you can get all of these expressions. And like I said, if you do it, if you post it to Slack and do it before Wednesday, and you know, it's not everyone, but I fact, I don't even care if it's everyone, post it, put it on there, if it's your own work and I see it, I'll give you a small amount of credit for that. I just want to see you going through the work and showing that you can do this stuff, okay? So this is a big confusing sort of module, really. Um, no, it's not really a big confusing module, it's a small confusing module because of this sort of added nomenclature we've just done. What we've got to try and remember is that this is just a means to an end. Okay, we'll be using this to create a set of expressions that we can use to analyze aircraft transient characteristics. Um, so now we've got these linear equations of motion, you might think we're done. We've got, we've got a whole, whole bunch of crap to do with these, I'm afraid. We're going to go through and we're going to, um, fundamentally, a lot of what we're going to spend our time doing is doing a Taylor series expansion to work out the partial derivatives of these with respect to everything. Um, and then we're going to spend a bit of time n normalizing these and then non-dimensionalizing them. So because these are all in dimensional formats, um, it's more commonplace to use non-dimensional derivatives in America um, something I've actually become sort of a convert to because they enable you to easily look at different aircraft and compare them but they are so much harder to get to okay there are there are, we'll develop these into the dimensional equations of motion in concise form and I'll show you those and then we're gonna skip over how we convert them fully into um, the non-dimensional format and I'll give you a lot of the equations that help us because that's actually a bit of a pain to do that bit of conversion. So today we've looked at linearization. There's a question as well on the website. So an example of an example, sorry, an example question you can do that looks at relative motion. So it's not just these that I need you to be able to do. I want you guys to be able to linearize expressions for everything we've done so far. So for example, the velocity of a of a point of the aircraft that isn't the aircraft axis, you can develop the velocity and the acceleration of that point using Coriolis theorem. And you can then use this theory to develop a nonlinear expression for that. Okay, so we're going to move on with continuing to build up these nonlinear expressions. Ultimately, we're going to end up with the set of equations in state space form. That's going to help us to do, um, do cool things like work out a transfer function between a control setting and the output of the aircraft. So we're going to move ahead with this. I'm going to leave this one here today. Um, I'll try and edit out all the bits where I've asked my dog to move. Apologies for the disturbances today. If there are questions, put it on Slack and I will see you all on Wednesday.